Hi everybody and thanks for joining us. This is meant to be the introductory training for the Dragonfly Volunteer Monitoring Program here at the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County. My name is Andres Ortega. I'm the invertebrate ecologist with the district. And we also have the contact information for Kathy Leck, who is our stewardship technician. If you have any questions related to this training, please send a message to either myself or Kathy at any time. So this training session is meant to be an introduction, particularly for those who are new monitors and maybe don't have any familiarity with dragonflies and damselflies. And as such, I want to give a little background, not just into our particular program, but what dragonflies and damselflies are, a little bit of discussion on their life history and some traits of their biology, and then we can talk more about our particular monitoring program, why we monitor for them, how we monitor for them, and then we'll conclude with a brief discussion of some of the most common species we have in the county. Let's start at the very beginning and identify what odonates actually are. So throughout the presentation I may say odonates, odonata, odes, dragonflies, damselflies, but essentially, I'm referring to one group of arthropods in class Insecta, order Odonata. So, arthropods are generally characterized by having exoskeletons. So, unlike us, where we have internal skeletons, their skeletons are in the form of a hard outer shell. And they also have segmented bodies. So, that means that if you look at an arthropod, you can see that their bodies are divided up into very distinct segments. So for insects, class Insecta, there are three body segments, and that's going to be the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And on both of these images, you can see that those segments are very clearly marked. So odonates are divided up essentially into two suborders. There's a third, but they're very uncommon, so we don't generally discuss them. But dragonflies in suborder Anisoptera, and that's a picture on the left, and then damselflies, which are suborder Zygoptera, and that's the image on the right. So one of the questions I get most frequently, especially from people that don't have any familiarity with odonates, are how do you identify between a dragonfly and a damselfly? Thankfully, there are a few key features you can look for. In particular, with dragonflies, one of the biggest things you can look for is size. And that's because dragonflies tend to be much larger, much stronger, much stouter than damselflies. And also, when at rest, dragonflies tend to hold their wings out to the side. They don't fold them above their body, say like a butterfly would. Instead, you can see this on the image on the left, they hold their wings straight out from their bodies. In comparison, damselflies tend to be much smaller, fragile, not very strong flyers, and they usually fold their wings above their bodies. So that image on the right, the wings aren't completely folded above their body, but you can see that they are a little bit more raised than the picture of the dragonfly. But definitely one of the things you want to look for too is activity. Dragonflies are much stronger flyers. So if you see something in the field that's zipping above your head, moving fast, it's probably a dragonfly. If you see something that has kind of a bobbing and weaving flight pattern, looks like a much weaker flyer and is much smaller, you're probably looking at a damselfly. Just for a little more background, let's talk about odonate life history. So they're considered a very ancient insect order, approximately 300 million years old. And they also have historically the largest insect species that ever existed, which is Meganeropsis permiana. So that dragonfly, and we can see a fossil record of that on the left, had about a two and a half foot wingspan. And you can see the image on the right is just comparing what that species would look like next to a modern day human, about a six foot tall person. Nowadays we don't have any species that large, though we do still have some fairly large dragonfly and damselfly species. Currently, the largest dragonfly species known is the giant petal tail, 
and that's a 6.3 inch wingspan and we find those in Australia. And the largest odonate in the world is the giant helicopter damselfly with a 7.5 inch wingspan and we find those primarily in Central and South America. One interesting aspect about odonates is that they're actually considered aquatic insects and that's because they spend much of their life in water as aquatic larvae. So they have what we call an incomplete life cycle where they have eggs, larvae, and then adults, but they don't have a pupal stage like a lot of other insects do. So like I said, the larvae are aquatic, they breathe through gills. If you look at the picture on the top left, that's of a damselfly larvae, and you see those two almost like tails coming out of the back of it, those are actually its gills. The image on the right is of a dragonfly larvae, and you see it doesn't have those, that's because it has internal gills. Now, most of the species we have here only spend up to about a year in the larval stage, but there are some species, including one we do have in the area, that can spend up to five years in the larval stage. Once they're ready to molt, they crawl out of the water on nearby vegetation, the adults hatch out of the larval skin, and then they spend the rest of their life as flying terrestrial adults. Usually they last about three to six weeks in this life stage. Both the adults and larvae are considered generalist predators, and really what that means is that they will eat anything they can catch. For the larvae, that's many different aquatic insects, and for some larger species of dragonfly larvae in particular, they can eat tadpoles and even small fish like minnows. Adults are also generalist predators. Generally, they'll catch any flying insect that they're able to, and they'll eat it. And that even does include other damselfly and dragonfly species. So, another interesting aspect about them that I'll just touch on briefly is that they have what we call a mating wheel. And you see the image on the bottom is of a dragonfly couple in the mating wheel. It doesn't actually form a perfect circle. As you can see, it's almost more of a heart shape. But it's interesting in that the male actually has claspers at the end of its abdomen and it grasps the female behind her head. That then prompts her to bring her abdomen up towards his body and he can actually deposit sperm and that's how the eggs are fertilized. So as we mentioned, the larvae are aquatic. Exclusively aquatic, they'll always be found in water. And that includes many different habitats. And so we have found dragonfly and damselfly larvae in rivers, streams, wetlands, seeps and springs, lakes, ponds, even roadside ditches and tree holes. Now in our area, the most common habitats we find them in are going to be streams and ponds. That's usually where we find both the greatest abundance as well as the greatest diversity. As you can expect with flying insects, adult habitat varies, but generally you'll find the adults near water. And it makes sense because that's where they're going to be breeding. So you sometimes can find them directly above the water, and usually when they're above the water they're in breeding mode. You can also find them nearby water and in nearby fields. And usually when they're in these locations, they're feeding or trying to find a mate. One thing about both damselflies and dragonflies is that you only will usually find them in open habitat. So you generally don't find them in shaded habitat like woodlands. And so in that example, like a woodland pond or a woodland stream, is not an ideal location to look for dragonflies or damselflies, with just a couple exceptions. And it's also worthy to note that some species perch and others patrol. And so what we're talking about there is just adult behavior, and we see that some species tend to spend more time perched where they rest on nearby vegetation, whereas other species very infrequently perch. You usually only find them flying around. They don't often settle down on vegetation until nighttime when they're resting. Now let's get a little bit more specific and talk about dragonflies in Illinois. 
So Illinois is home to many different species of dragonflies and damselflies. Currently, the estimate is that there's 99 species of dragonflies in Illinois, and that's out of 316 total in the United States. Also, Illinois is home to approximately 43 species of damselflies, and that's out of 131 in the United States. So for both dragonflies and damselflies, Illinois is home to about a third of the total species in the United States. As I mentioned before, they're found by most bodies of water. And Illinois is actually home to one federally endangered species, which is the only federally endangered species of dragonfly, and that's the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. And that species does occur in DuPage County in very limited numbers. We also have one state threatened species, which is the elfin skimmer. The odinate species in Illinois come from a variety of different families. So for DuPage County, the dragonflies consist primarily of the darners, which are large active flyers. The skimmers, which are a little bit smaller, tend to perch more frequently and have colorful wings and bodies the club tails, which have rounded or clubbed abdomen, and the emeralds, which are characterized by having bright green eyes in most of the species. For damselflies, the most common families we have here are the spread wings, which are the damselflies that tend to hold their wings out to the side, almost like a dragonfly. The broad winged damselflies, where the wings are broader at the base, meaning where they connect to the body, and usually brightly colored. And the pond damsels, which are a very widespread, very diverse group of damselflies that have narrow wing bases. All of this has been great background information. We know what dragonflies and damselflies are. We know some basics about their biology and their life history. We have some background in what species and families are in Illinois. But it all still begs the question, why do we monitor for dragonflies? And there's a few answers for that. So dragonfly monitoring is a great intro into wildlife monitoring in general. That's because they're very charismatic, easy to see insects. They're often very colorful, very active, and so they serve as a gateway species. In learning how to monitor for odonates, you're also learning basic aspects of monitoring for other wildlife. Monitoring data is also valuable because dragonflies and damselflies can be used as indicators. What we mean by that is that the presence or absence over time of certain species can indicate maybe about water quality. As an example, let's say we have a very rare species by a particular body of water and that species appears year after year. That might indicate that that's a high quality patch of water. Conversely, let's say that we had a rare species and some construction project happened and that species disappeared, it might indicate that there were human impacts to their habitat. So really with this monitoring data, we're getting a view of species composition over time, meaning losses and addition of species, and using that as indicators of potential impacts or of high quality habitat. Currently, we're providing our data to the Illinois Odinate Survey. So very briefly, the mission statement of the survey is to gain a greater knowledge of the distribution and abundance of dragonfly and damselfly species in the Chicago region, and eventually to expand the network across Illinois and beyond. So the survey, IOS, started as the Dragonfly Monitoring Network. In 2011, they expanded to receive information from throughout Illinois. And just recently, this year, earlier in 2017, they moved into the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. So, now that we know why we monitor, let's talk a little bit more about what the actual monitoring protocol is. And this is developed from the iOS, previously the DMN monitoring protocol. So here are the basics of what you can expect whenever you do a monitoring route. So you're going to be walking a predetermined route, and that'll be myself and other district staff determine where these routes are. 
you will go out when it's optimal weather conditions. And what we mean by that is optimal for the dragonflies. And so that's going to be between 10 and 3 on a sunny, warm, and low wind day. Those are the best conditions for dragonflies and damselflies to be out flying. You want to walk your route a minimum six times per season. And ideally you'll space these six times out and not do them all at once. The reason for that is because some species are found early in the year, some species are found late in the year. So if you space out your six minimum walks, you'll find potentially a different suite of species. Whenever you go out, you want to record the temperature, the amount of cloud cover as a percentage, and that's just an estimate, the wind, if you can get that from, say, like a weather website or a weather app, that would be great, but if not, estimate the wind. And then, most importantly, you want to record your start and stop time. So as you're walking your route, you're going to record the odonate species you see as you see them. Usually using tally marks is best, as if you use just regular numbers, you're going to have to scratch those off as you see additional uh, individuals. You walk your route at a steady pace, and it's whatever is steady for you, whatever you feel comfortable walking. You also need to keep in mind, going back to when we said you record your start and stop time, you want to subtract any idle time, and that's time that you're not actively monitoring for dragonflies. So let's say as you're walking your route, you stop to maybe get a really good picture of a dragonfly, or you stop to get a drink of water. If it's just a minute or so, you don't have to subtract that. But if you take like a 10 or 15 minute break, you do want to subtract that from your overall monitoring time. And as you're walking this route, you want to picture yourself in a bubble 20 feet in any direction. Meaning you can look 20 feet to your left, 20 feet to your right, 20 feet in front of you, 20 feet behind you, and 20 feet above you. And you don't want to record anything outside of that bubble. Now, that can be very difficult, and it'll be very tempting sometimes when you see something maybe 30 or 40 or 50 feet away. But just to standardize our data, we have to make sure that you're only recording in about that 20-foot bubble, 20 feet in either direction. Those are the basics of monitoring, but there's a couple other things to keep in mind. So, as you can expect, this is field monitoring you need to come prepared to be outside for around two hours, give or take, depending on your route. And that means wearing weather-appropriate clothing, wearing a hat, bringing water with you, and I'd also recommend mud boots on most routes. We try and keep you out of water as much as we can, but some areas can be a little wet, so I would recommend some mud boots. We do try and provide routes near your home or near your work, whatever you'd prefer. But routes are limited. We only have so many preserves, and we can only set up so many routes in each preserve. So essentially, we handle them first come, first serve. But we will always work with you as best we can to get you a preferred route. Also keep in mind, some routes might be wetter than others. As they are aquatic insects, and as their habitat tends to be by water, some of the routes can get wet. We try and keep you out of large areas of standing water, but still, again, mud boots are recommended. Also keep in mind that learning odonates takes time. It's not something that's necessarily going to come right away, and you shouldn't expect to be an expert your first year, and that's okay. In my opinion, if you can learn even just a few species your first year, you've been a successful monitor. And every year, you'll get a little bit better. If your first year you learn 5 to 10 species, that next year will be easier because you'll already know those species and you can focus on the ones you don't know. Very importantly, you also want to make sure you're only recording what you're sure of to the level you're sure of. If all you can record is that you saw a large black dragonfly, for example, that's all we want you to record. The reason for this is that it's much better and much preferable to have incomplete data than it is to have incorrect data. 
And so we really just want to make sure that you're not guessing on your identifications and that if you're really not sure about something, that you only write down the level that you are sure to. Also, you are more than welcome to bring a partner, and in many cases I would actually recommend that. That's someone that can help keep you company, someone that can do the recording on the data sheet, someone that can help carry equipment. But keep in mind, only one person should be observing dragonflies, and it should be the same person every time. So if you are signed up as the monitor, you're more than welcome to have a partner, but make sure that every time you go out, you're the only one monitoring. And again, the reason for that is just to have consistency of data so that we know who was out monitoring each time that data was submitted. Finally, and I can't stress this enough, if you need help, if you have questions, if there's some issue with your route, please just ask us. And again, at the beginning of this presentation was the contact information for myself and Kathy Leck. We are more than willing to work with you for any issues that might occur, but we need you to bring these issues to our attention. So here we have an example of what one of our predetermined routes looks like. So what you'll notice is that any given route is divided up into sections, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B each one corresponding to a different color. Now, if you look closely, you'll see that any given section, such as 1A or 1B, might be divided up into a number of different unconnected subsections. That's okay. All you need to know is that when you're recording your data, if you're on any section of your route that says 1A, you record that data under the 1A column. If you're in any section called 1B, you record under the 1B column. That's all there is to it. Whatever section you're in, you write under that column, regardless of if it's the first 1A you are in or the second 1A, it all goes under the 1A column. If you have any questions with this, please don't hesitate to contact Kathy or myself prior to going out for the season. Next, let's take a look at what the recording and reporting data sheets actually look like. So again, on the top, you'll see some of that basic information you need to fill out, such as your site, the time, start and stop time, the weather conditions. And you want to bring out a fresh sheet each time you go out monitoring. So, as I mentioned in the last slide, you want to indicate the sections of your route at the top of your table. 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, whatever sections your route has, that's what you want to write in each column. And then, as you go and observe, you want to use a hash mark in each column corresponding to that route section you're observing in. So now let's talk about both the most challenging and also the most rewarding aspect of the monitoring program, and that's how to identify dragonflies. So there's a lot of guides out there, and a lot of them have great technical information, but it's very difficult to stop when something's flying in front of you, moving fast, and look away and start referencing a guide to see if you can figure out what it is. So. I would still recommend using guides, but when you're in the field, I found that focusing on three characteristics will really help you identify what that dragonfly or damselfly is. So the first characteristic is relative size. And just ask yourself, was it very big? Was it very small? Was it medium sized? And then also look at body markings. Did it have any kind of coloration or markings on the body? Was it yellow? Was it shiny? Did it have spots? And then finally, you also want to look at wing markings. Did it have any wing markings? Did it have any color on the wings? If so, what? If you can focus on these three aspects, you'll definitely be able to narrow down what you were looking at. This image just shows some of the body segments of a dragonfly. And they're important to know, especially when you're using guides, as many of the guides will reference these various segments. Just keep in mind 
that these do exist, and if you're using a guide, you might have to understand what body parts it's referencing. Now let's talk about the final aspect of the intro training, which is discussing some of the common species of the Chicago region. So this list is not exact, and it's just based off of anecdotal data, as well as the most common species in our database here at the district. So we're going to just briefly go over these species, look at some of these aspects that I discussed previously, like body size and wing markings, and get you more familiar with looking at these species and learning how different these species can look. Let's start with what is probably the most common dragonfly you're going to see, which is a common green darner. So these are very large dragonflies. They have blue or green or both bodies. And so you'll see in the male, which is that top image, it has a green thorax and a blue abdomen. If you look at that lower image, you'll see that male, but you'll also see a female, which is mostly just a drab green, not as brightly colored. They don't have any wing markings, but they're pretty distinct both in their size and the fact that they're very active flyers, and you usually see them first of the season and last of the season. Usually I see these starting in April, and I can see them sometimes up until October, if it stays warm enough. Next we have the Eastern Pond Hawk, again a very common species in our area. These are a little bit smaller than the Green Darners, and they're definitely perchers, they're not as active of flyers. The males, which that's the top image, are a powdery blue color. And so it's not a very bright blue, but more of a powdery drab blue. Females are actually extremely different looking from males. And so the female on the bottom there is actually a bright green and has black markings on the abdomen. These are, like I said, medium size, perchers, and don't have any real wing markings. Moving on, we have the black saddlebags. I'd say this is probably the second largest species we have in the area, right after the green darner. So these are very distinct because they have those large black saddlebag style patches on the base of the hind wings, and you see that in both males and females. The males have a bluish blackish body, no real patterns. Females have a blackish body as well, but they also have some yellow on the abdomen. And these are also very active flyers as well. But again, very easily identified by those very large black basal patches on the hind wings. The blue dasher is another small bluish species, so in some cases it can be confused with the eastern pond hawk. These are a little bit smaller though. And what you'll notice is that the males, while they have that powdery blue color on the abdomen, don't have it across the whole body. If you look closely at that top image, you'll see that the thorax of the male has black and yellow stripes. Females also on the thorax have black and yellow stripes, and the abdomen is blackish and yellowish in color. Sometimes in the males, you'll also find a very, very small amount of amber on the wings, and these are also common perchers. You don't see these flying as frequently as you see them perched on vegetation. After that, we have the 12 spotted skimmer. So these are a little bit larger in size. They're comparable maybe to the Eastern Pond Hawk. These are extremely common, especially by ponds and lakes. The males, which you see on top, have alternating black and white patterns on the wings. Overall, it's 12 black spots, which is where they get the name from, and they have bluish black bodies. Females don't have any white on the wings, but they still do have those 12 black spots. And in terms of body coloration, they're a fairly drab brown with lateral yellow stripes on the abdomen. So those are stripes going down the side of the abdomen. Another skimmer we have is the Widow Skimmer. Again, medium size. Males, again, have that bluish, blackish body color. What you'll notice on the wings of the males are that they have very large basal black spots on all four wings. And then immediately after that, they have large white spots. 
Females are a little bit different. They also have the large basal black spots on all four wings, but they also have black tips on all four wings as well. In terms of body color, the females are that drab brownish or blackish color and have lateral yellow thoracic stripes and abdominal stripes. The final skimmer we'll talk about is the common whitetail. So, once again, a medium-sized dragonfly that's very common by lakes and ponds. The males are pretty easy to identify. So, in the middle of all four wings, they have a black stripe, but what you'll really notice about them is that they have a powdery white abdomen, which is where they get their name from. Now, females can be a little bit difficult. If you look closely, you'll see that the female is very similar to 12-spot females. The best way to identify between the females of the two species is to recognize that the 12 spot females on the side of the abdomen have yellow stripes, whereas these, the common white tail females on the sides of the abdomen, have not a complete stripe but more of a triangular pattern. It's a very fine distinction and so I'd recommend that you go back to the 12 spot skimmer slide and compare those females with the common whitetail females. Now let's talk about damselflies, and we're going to start with one of the most common species, which is the eastern forktail. So, one thing you'll notice about many different damselflies is they're very hard to identify, and that's because of a combination of factors. One is that they're very small, and so the features you're looking for can be difficult to observe. Also, many damselflies take on different color forms. What that means is that you might be looking at one species, but say, for example, the female of that species can take on two or three or even more different color forms. And that's what we see in the eastern forktail. So, the males are generally green-bodied with a blue abdominal tip. And you see that's the damselfly on the left green thorax, and then if you look at the tip of the tail, you can see a little bit of blue on it. However, the females can either be orange, or they can be colored like the male, or, as you can see in this picture, they can have a slightly grayish tint to the body. Thankfully, the American ruby spot is a lot easier to identify. And so these are fairly large as far as damselflies go. And what you'll notice in both the male and female is that they have a fairly large red basal spot on the wings. You'll see that it's more distinct on the males, that's the one on the left. But even on the females, you can see that basal red patch on the wings. And without a doubt, if you see that on a damselfly, you know that you're looking at an American ruby spot. Finally, we have the blue-fronted dancer. And so again, this is a very small, very common damselfly species. What you'll notice is that the thorax of the male is almost entirely blue. But you do see a very, very thin black thoracic stripe, and that's on what we call the shoulder area behind the eye. You also notice that only abdominal segments 8 through 10 are blue. And that goes back to that image I showed you earlier of all the different body parts of dragonflies and damselflies. For many damselflies, the difference can be a single abdominal segment. And so keep in mind for the blue front of dancer, only segments 8 through 10 are blue. The female of this species, again, unfortunately, takes many different color forms. They can be blue, or they can be brown or they can be similar in coloration to the male. That covers it as far as the most common species in our area. I anticipate as you go out monitoring that you'll see many more species than that, but those are easily our most common species, and I would expect on most routes that you'll see the majority of those species. Now, there are some resources and guides to help you while you're out monitoring, and these are just a few. Dragonflies through binoculars is an excellent resource. Damselflies of the Northeast is what I personally use for identifying damselflies. Dragonflies and damselflies of the East is also good. 
You can also use bugguide.net, and that's a user-driven web page where you can submit pictures for identification. Keep in mind, not everyone on that page is a professional, but by and large, all the identifications I've seen on that page tend to be accurate. And of course, IllinoisOdes.org has much great background information on odinates in our area, in um, recording data, in reporting data, and other aspects of the program. That concludes the Dragonfly Monitoring Program intro training. Thank you so much for your time. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please reference the contact emails at the beginning of this presentation and just let us know and we'll be happy to help you. Thank you very much again and good luck out there.